everybody. Welcome to Life of BriancaJ.com. Today I am going to be covering uh, my latest class assignment, which was Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner. This book is torturous to say the least. It is going to be a trick of the mind, keeping up with all the temporal distortion, the shifts in narrators, and finding out which of your narrators are telling you the truth. But before we get into that, you should know that this book is a crucial part of the literary canon so this is one of the 100 books that you must read to be considered uh, intelligent so William Faulkner 1936 uh, originally the book only sold 6,000 copies interestingly enough but this book helped him win the Nobel Peace Prize in the 40s so the book is a wonderful capsulation of everything that the South is and the racial discrimination and the complex issues that make it a hard and complicated history to understand. Um, <clears throat> basically, the book follows the life of Thomas Sutpen, a character that you don't actually meet within the novel because he has already passed, but surviving relatives and friends resurrect his memory as a metaphor of the South uh, during the Confederate rule. So what you see here is Thomas Sutpen coming from West Virginia, a self-made man with a band of slaves determined to build a plantation and marry a respectable wife and bear children, which he succeeds in. So he comes from West Virginia and they kind of picks him like your wild western man, two pistols on his pocket with a band of slaves. He ends up, you know, building his own home through the swamps and clearing out this land uh, takes him two years to build it and once he does he begins to set out to find a respectable wife doing this he marries Ellen Coldfield. Ellen Coldfield is going to become his wife and though she is a little bit poor her father is respected in the county so that makes her someone that can represent his American dream attainment so she marries him he, he fathers Judith and Henry and then he just kind of secludes himself. He has his children, he has his wife, he has everything he wants. He no longer deals with the town. Mostly he hangs out in his own backwoods and uh, fights with his nigger slaves, as he calls them. Uh, <clears throat> he often brings Henry down to watch him battle the slaves in these fights. Once Henry grows up, he goes to college. When Henry gets to college, the plot takes a little bit of a turn. He meets Charles Bond and becomes infatuated with him. He brings Charles Bond home, and she he immediately falls for his sister Judith. Once he falls for sister Judith, they begin to learn that Charles Bond is not all that he may seem. Thomas Sutpen, the father, goes to find out a little more about Charles Bond, and comes back and tells him that Charles already has a wife and a child. This brings a little bit of issue to the plot here. You know, Charles needs to renounce the wife in order to marry Judith, but he refuses. Before everything can go down, we get to the Civil War. Charles and Henry join the Civil War together, where Henry finds out that not only is Charles married to a black woman with a black child, he is also his half-brother. This makes things very complicated. Now we find out that this is an incestuous issue, and we also realize that Thomas Sutpen knew that this Charles Bond character was his son the entire time. So then it comes to the question of why didn't he tell anyone? At this point, we find out that Thomas Sutpen also goes to the Civil War. Upon his return back, he finds out that Ch Henry has killed Charles Bond. Not only does he find out that Henry, that Charles is his brother, that he is married and that he has a partially uh, nigger child and nigger wife, he then finds out that Charles Bond himself has nigger blood. Now this is absolutely unacceptable for Henry. He cannot fathom the idea that uh, her sister will be married to a nigger. This is impossible. and. Henry does what he feels he has to do and kills Charles before this can, can this can happen. Um, now you have to also understand that Thomas Sutton actually knew this and therefore had a 
black son, which is also tells us why Suppin never acknowledged Charles' uh, legitimacy as his progeny. Um, during, you have to understand that during the South, it's so complicated that white supremacy ruled and pure-blooded white men were the only acceptable heir you could have. Um, he had to find an heir for his estate and his property, and he was a Southern gentleman now. He had a Southern gentleman, a uh, Southern woman, a Southern lady to marry him. He had land, he had money, he had slaves. He was upper echelon Southern plantation owner, and he could not taint his family legacy with an heir of a black son. Uh, of course, once the Civil War ends, all of this has ended as well. When Thomas Suppin re returns home from the war, he finds himself completely bankrupt. Um, Suppin's Hundred, his plantation, is now down to Suppin's One. Uh, only remaining slave left is Clyde, who also is Thomas Suppin's uh, illegitimized daughter. Uh, Judith and Rosa Coldfield, uh, the aunt of Judith and Henry, and the sister to Thomas Suppin's wife. Once Thomas Suppin returns home and sees that everything he's worked for in his life is gone, including Henry, who has run away and renounced his inheritance, and Charles Bond is dead, and Judith is now a spinster, and his wife has died from disease, he is desperate to reconstruct his life. He wants to get his upper echelon, um, class back so he's desperate he looks to rosa as to to marry him and be his wife in order to uh, rebuild his estate rosa agrees because there are aren't, aren't any man any men left in the confederate south at this time there are all these men all the young men who have went to serve in the civil war have died and she feels she has no other option if she wants to attain her American dream, she must marry, and Thomas Suppin is her only choice. She agrees to marry him, but soon after the engagement, she finds out that Thomas Suppin wants to first try and bear a son, and if they succeed in rearing a son, he will then go ahead and marry her. She refuses. She is a Southern lady. She will not be uh, subject to that, and she is disrespected and angry about it even 43 years later even at the suggestion so she leaves she moves back into her father's home and Thomas Suppin is left scrambling to pick up the little fragments of the life he has left he is now looking to marry Millie the granddaughter of his overseer Wash Jones um, he's messing with Millie uh, they're kind of hooking up, and then Millie gets pregnant. Millie gets pregnant, and she buries a girl. This infuriates Thomas Suppin. He treated <coughs> Millie so terribly that Wash Jones then <coughs> kills... Then goes ahead and kills Thomas Suppin. Thomas Suppin dies with everything in his life destroyed completely bankrupt broke uh this story is obviously a tale of the south uh, thomas Suppin embodies the same qualities that the antebellum south had racial uh, discrimination human exploitation economic advancement from slavery miscegenation uh genealogy uh, family drama um there's that uh southern hospitality appeal of Rosa being a lady and him trying to acclaim this worthy and respectability. There's also that American dream here. So this is the tale of the South. He uses four different narrators because not only one narrator could really compound everything that happened in this novel and to get the full complexity and the full disgust and that he is trying to send to the readers. Faulkner, I do mean is trying to appeal to the readers he needs to employ four different narrators in order to do this so he uses quentin compson who works at the channel of to kind of intercept and make us understand the motivations of thomas Suppin through the stories of rosa coldfield who knows thomas personally and his jilted fiance through mr compson 
who knows only stories of Thompson's um, sorry, stories of Sutpen told from him by his grandfather and the stories make him look like a hero and like a Gatsby figure. He We also hear the story from Shreve, a Canadian northerner who does not understand this American racism or <coughs> especially the Confederate South. So he almost looked at this as an amusing, comical show of folklore. And then there is Quentin Compson, a character we know from Sound of the Fury. He also is our omniscient narrator and this story cripples him and in the end it ends with Shreve asking Henry uh, sorry Shreve asking Quentin so why do you hate the South and Quentin dramatically says I don't I don't I do not hate the South um, here we find just as Faulkner Quentin is having issues wrestling with his home and country and loyalty but still um, being affected by the past ugliness of what the South did and what it represented and how it treated the people. Um, the book is very complex. Uh, you're going to go through 36 word sentences. You're going to run into vocabulary that you have never seen and you will struggle through this work. Um, but I challenge you all to read it. I think though that the challenge is very well worth it. It is tough, but it well worth it. You are going to get a really intimate view of the American South during that time. It's almost like you get an intimate view into inside Faulkner's mind, and it's amazing. Dark, but amazing. Um, I would love for you to read it, and also I am going to link my paper, my research paper on it, to the blog beneath this video. And of course, uh, tell me what you think. Tell me what you felt about the novel. If you've read the novel and you love it, or if you choose to. Other than that, happy reading and have a great day.